Diamonds are forever. Hello and welcome to day 10 of Bon Simba. My name is Tom. I'm Joe. And he's back, yes, I'm back, yes, hello, yes, ah, uh, yes, Sean Connery, yes, 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 okay. yes. <laughs> I, so All this right. is short, this is, oh uh, dear, uh, Sean Connery's back, um, which is sort of like, I, I don't know really what to sort of make of this film, because it's, it, it, it is, as I think we, we've discussed, this is, this uh, before, obviously we, we recorded this, this is Bond being, you know, up until this point, Bond has been a very, you know, active series. It has gone numb. We are doing this film. We are doing, you know, bigger, better, but bigger budget. This is the first time that Bond starts to feel reactive. That Bond is reacting to outside forces in, you know, cinema and yeah. Oh, <laughs> it's a. Uh, I remember severely disliking this movie the first time I saw it and I've what now I watch it now I was a li I'm softer on it but it is definitely not the movie you make after Honor Majesty's Secret mm. Service it it, it 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 basically in a, in one word it is it's it's a 180 u-turn it's like okay uh people didn't like lesson B uh make gold fake golden golfing ring that is pretty much yeah. Diamonds off. Get the director of Goldfinger. Get a which one of his Ian Fleming's plots is similar to Goldfinger? Oh, oh, Diamonds instead of Gold. Let's do that. And, get Shirley Bassey. Get Shirley Bassey. Yeah, I mean it's not a one-to-one -one match, but there is definitely a, pro a problem for like when producers are trying to figure out what to do with the next James Bond movie. They just decide to make the one, bef the one that was a big hit before it. Hmm. Like, uh, The Spy Who Loved Me, uh, like, became a bit massive critical and hit, so they made, decided to make Moonraker, which has almost the exact same plot, but off the rails. <laughs> so, I... Well, yeah, we'll get to that one, I do <laughs> So, yeah. I, yeah. Now, we say it's obviously, like, Goldfinger 2, you know, Goldfinger 2. Um, except it doesn't have, like, the, the, the sort of attention to detail that sort of Goldfinger 2 has because yeah this is a complete fucking mess of a film yeah it's uh it's it's I, chaos it's like I don't know what they're entirely trying to do here and it's just like uh to the point where you know Bond locate Bond movies are about going to exotic locations and then doing these grand chases and you know, all of that stuff. But this one takes place mostly in Las Vegas, which is kind of a place you go to if you want a copy of the actual places you want to go because mm. everything else is too expensive. <clears throat> and that's kind of how this movie feels. It kind of feels like the less expensive, less extravagant version of the other James Bond films. Yeah, it, it's... It it feels I'm gonna this, this is quite quite rude. It feels like a greatest hits compilation of stuff that went before. Oh, yeah. you know. Oh, you want a a sort of you know a active Bond girl? Okay, we're gonna put pair Bond with you know a diamond smuggler who you know played by Jill St. John Tiffany Case. And it's like okay, you want Blofeld? Blofeld's back. Blofeld's back. Uh, and uh, is um, um, you you. You like that guy who was in uh, <laughs> You Only Live Twice for Two Minutes as that uh, expatriate in Japan? Well, he, we'll make him Blofeld. <laughs> there, there you go. Maybe it's he just was... a jump to the left. Maybe he was Blofeld all along. Who can tell? I don't know. Did we kill because Blofeld? <laughs> the plot involves a lot of plastic surgery and Blofeld, uh, you know, disguising himself as another person. Yeah. And... Um, you want a random by standard... Charles Gray, who I think does a good job this time, mm. but um, it's like Charles being played by the professor from the Rocky Horror Picture Show is on brand for how goofy and just weirdly it's camp. It's just camp. It's a campy mess. It's, 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 it's yeah. <laughs> So the plot in this basically is Bond. There are a number of 
diamond smugglers who are being killed off in sort of basically you follow these diamonds as they sort of traveled um, smuggled from person to person and all of these people be to be mysteriously murdered and it's here that we get sort of the biggest i think i feel like the the single two worst characters in bond up to this point <laughs> mr went and mr kid yes the who are you know in the novel and it's pretty blatantly subtext that they are like you know in a relationship Gay lovers yeah <laughs> this is this is like the manly men of the 40s and the 50s like when they often had opponents like uh uh the maltese falcon uh the villains like peter lorry and you know the guy who plays the fat guy um i can't remember his name but they are obviously coded as gay in ways that would be very obvious to like the audiences who read their book the mm. books and this is kind of like pulp me men who survived world war ii stuff where uh you know they would have the villain is the other and the other is the these gay characters who like um like they are you know offensive and horrible but they are played to the best of their abilities by uh, Putter Smith and Bruce Glover. <laughs> yeah. Like a jazz. I a, wish a jazz musician. I wish they were not offen like offensive. Uh, you know, just things for the super hyper, you know, aggro male mm. to play off of, and like I am super so superior to you, and I'm so hor. I wish they were actually um, well-rounded characters, <laughs> well-read characters, or like actual. Because they're at the start, they're played. I mean, they're psychotic, and you know, there's, you know, whatever you can put with that uh, mm. as you know, gay. But they are actually smart, efficient villains. Like they <laughs> kill everybody reasonably well, and they are, and they do it with you know. A certain uh, joie de vivre, certain and quippy, you know, it's yeah. kind of charming. But then Bond comes into the picture, and they just suddenly can't kill anybody. They are suddenly horribly incompetent, which means they are clearly weaker to this superior male, Manly you man. know, heterosexual <laughs> man. At, who, I mean, the I, and you know. It sort of derails from there. <laughs> it derails from there. Like, yeah. this is the ultimate, why don't you just kill him Bond movie? Mm. Like, you know, you obviously have the son from uh, Austin Powers, uh, who is like, <laughs> I'm going to get a gun. We can shoot him right here. It'll be fun. <laughs> and it's just... No, we'll put, him in, we'll, we'll put him in a coffin and we'll pretend we'll burn him. But uh, he, 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 oh, the diamonds he gave this character aren't real. Um... We're just gonna let him go, okay? Yeah. <laughs> We're gonna yeah, throw, it's... throw him out, try and throw him out the window. No, that's not worked. Uh, we're gonna basically kidnap him and um, take him to a facility, but he won't. He'll escape in a moon buggy. <laughs> <laughs> we'll then gas him. Uh, he's gonna get taken to Las Vegas and comes across a rat that helps him out. Yes, this really happens. Yes. Uh, and then uh, Bond then is pretty much left to sort of rave around during the end action action set piece. Uh, yeah, again, it, <laughs> it's like you would think Blofeld at this point had had enough. It's, it's like, just like yeah. there is a point even in an egotistical, world ruling asshat who has had like his plans blow up in his face because of his own, you know ego and need yeah. for scale yeah. that <laughs> you can just say enough yeah, you can, just stop. If, if you assume that this is like you know that the, the, it happens in the same universe as where you are uh, as on her majesty because we're not going to open that particular kettle of fish but i don't know yeah yeah this is now like the third time they've met in in the canon yeah it's like at this point you go well he's either going to foil my plans or he's not and you know two out of three times suggest yes he's going to do it um <laughs> I, I could just shoot him this this might be you know considering i have 
these these doubles and the film sort of starts off with um bond pursuing blofeld across the world and eventually coming across both him and a double um yeah just send one of your doubles to deal with them if he doesn't succeed you can just send another one yeah it's... Rather, than, rather than basically imbeciles <laughs> I mean, I think at this point we are beyond I need to do this in an impressive fashion or a theatrical fashion. I need to get a revolver and just shoot him in the back of the, the head and I need his brain, brain splattered right in front of me and we can just drag him off, dump him off the... dump him into the desert somewhere and call it a day. <laughs> Yeah, it's sort of. This is where I th I feel this is this is the film that sort of you know if Thunderball sort of shows a, a few of the cracks in the Bond formula, this is like a yawning chasm of bad. <laughs> yeah, it's. <laughs> it also doesn't help that it's just doesn't seem interested in itself. Mm. Like there is one exotic location they go to outside of Las Vegas. It's Amsterdam. There is a extremely low budget uh, spy movie called Secret Agent Super Dragon. It has better shots of uh, the Netherlands than the mo the Bond <laughs> movie that takes place in the Netherlands. And that's I realize this is just kind of a throwaway location to start the film, but ye gad, you like they literally go on a tour and they tell you why you should care about this part of Amsterdam and they don't shoot it well. It's not, mm. it's essentially a throwaway sequence in a throwaway movie. Yeah. And even like the, the, you know, the Blayfeld's big scheme in this is, uh, destroy nuclear weapons. Uh, do you not want, do you not want your nuclear weapons destroyed? Then give me money. And it's like, it's I like, like really, Blofeld? You're not even like you know. Last time you had a a really good plan. You wanted to kill. You wanted to basically hold all of the you know the working the, sort of the crops in you know Western in civilization to ransom with you know this very intricate hypnosis scheme. You, now you're basically just going down to give us money or we will take away your bombs. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it, it's it's like oh, I've got a satellite. That it's not even like you know he's now got like some of the nuclear bombs and he will destroy them if you know he's not given the money. It's I've got this satellite which we've already launched by the way, you know that we don't even see launch. The bomb doesn't even get a chance to stop, you know, because that yeah. would be too exciting for this film. That that would be a set piece. <laughs> that would be exciting. I mean, it's not to say there's nothing in this. There's a part where they go to the circus circus casino that and that's impressive it it looks really good and um you know there are a few things like they do convincing uh set work um when james bond is uh slinging around the white house which is uh we should say that blofeld is obviously disguising himself as a uh american entrepreneur named uh willard white and he has a Ve vegas casino and entertainment place called the white house it, and um eventually bond has to get to the roof and he's slinging around and that part of it looks good i mean that even though i know it's a set it, that that actually had some like thrills and then it's like oof i had a little bit of my fear of height in there but um a lot of this movie is on sets in under interesting places like you get one fight sequence in a glass elevator and it's kind of neat because it's glass elevator, but that glass, it breaks like peanut brittle. <laughs> and, it just like, looks I'm bad. surprised that thing is still in was still in service before they got there because it, because like Bond leans against it and it breaks, and then they just have this little fight on this glass elevator, and it's well utilized. I want to say to this movie's credit, it is edited really well, and I don't know if it's just because. They didn't have enough to show us that it had to move along. And this, like, the first half is when the movie usually drags is, like, br very briskly paced. You're, you're there, you're there, you're, everything is moving along. And even if you don't understand why everybody's doing everything, because the plot is just such a muddled thing of I don't care, 
we're, we're following a path of diamonds and whoop de doo hmm. it's a bucket of diamonds and where are the diamonds uh um where's the the money for the diamonds and they're both counterfeit oh no hmm. and it's a lot of so what and it takes until 90 minutes into the film until the it stops being so what but it's all briskly paced and you know there's some character to it like you know they there's not zero effort uh there sean connery still has his attitude and a lot of his like cheesy one lines come off and there's like nice double talk between the various lines of henchmen where you know they're pretending to do a legitimate business but they're also uh you know doing this diamond smuggling and uh all of this and you know it's kind of fun like when they go to the funeral home and every it's everything's being morbidly humorous. It's fun, but then they have like the ultimate trap for Bond where he's put in a cremation uh, casket and <laughs> is being burned alive. And then they just bail him out of it because hmm. it's because he didn't actually give them the diamonds. Why? Because Q Branch still has him. He has to send them up. Why? We do don't know. And yeah. then it goes back to being so what it, to the point where they go to this Willard White facility in, you know, the Nevada desert where they are working on NASA stuff. And he just walks in on like space training stuff. So, and they're like, that's not a toy. Get him away from there. So he drives a moon buggy theoretically for, to, to go on the moon. And there's just action sequences where like the, the henchmen aren't even like, you know, the professional henchmen of Spectre. They are security guards at a um, American facility by an entrepreneur who probably doesn't pay them that well. And they are riding ATVs and they are not doing it well. And it's just like, OK, um, so we're it's, doing that. It's just and, and the longer it goes on, it's sort of like, oh, God, are we still here? Is this still going? Is this like, is Sean Connery still here? And I like, he got paid like $1.25 million pounds to come back. You know, this was like mm -hmm. a record high thing for like an actor. So, you know, this is like the highest sal at this point. I believe this is the highest salary any actor was paid for any one film. Mm -hmm. And it was like, for this, really? Yeah. You brought him back it's for like, this. It also, M can be barely arsed to be in the movie. Q, it can barely ar be arsed. I mean, Lois Maxwell as Money Penny does more in this movie than M and Q combined. Like, and she only has one tiny scene where she shows up at a customs where J James Bond has to have a cover ID. So he mm. steals a car and their passport. And she is disguised as a custom agent yeah. who helps facilitate it. Like, and then Money Penny's gone from the rest of the movie, and then he has to call Q on the phone, and he does. They don't even do the rigmarole where Q describes all the tools and stuff. I, which I guess is an improvement because it's like Chekhov's gun when it comes to Q. Like everything on Q's desk is going to be used in the movies, except the ones that are like used for one-off gags. Because ha 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 ha, we have a ghetto blaster, and it's a boombox with a rocket launcher. Ha ha ha. But, um, yeah, it's like they made the movie because they had to make a movie. And yeah. There, there are good parts of the movie. I don't want to say Jill St. John did badly, but she was not given a character with clear motivations to work with. Like she, she's kind of just there and she, she kind of leans to whoever is in the scene and she's for, you know, the free wheeling, you know, thief character who, you know, mm. is strong willed. It's like she, it's not there. There's something missing and it feels like there's a character missing. And it's just, it's an, just kind of an attitude of, you know, be a sassy, morally gray woman and. Yeah. And not actually do anything. It's like, yeah. I mean, I think, like, some of the bright spots come in way too late. Like, uh, we have uh, entrepreneur, uh, musician, all sorts of titles. Guy Jimmy Dean 
is the actual Willard White that um, it, Blofeld has kidnapped and is holding hostage. And he is just this apparently American person, uh, American, like, god of a uh, entrepreneur, which, um, like, Felix Leiter goes in one scene, like, the president I can get you a meeting with. Willard White, not so much. And he has that, like, southern drawl entrepreneur attitude, and it's, like, really charming, and it's really fun, and it's nice to, like, see a different kind of, like, rich person. It's like this, they're kind of doing Goldfinger 2.0, like, mm. like, Goldfinger was his own character, and and who is just this kind of cheating asshat, but then we have Willard White, who is this just the Southern good old boy who is, <laughs> uh, you know, fr friends with everybody in his organization, but, you know, he stays away from because he's too rich for all of them. And there's that attitude that I like, but he is in the last 25 minutes of the movie, and most of it is just, most of his appearances is being a voice because uh, Blofeld has tapes that can magically make his voice the other person so he has essentially taken over Willard White's business and the way they execute that is pretty cool and then you know there's obviously the climax and it's kind of it's at an oral refinery so it's like oh yawn this set is drab I mean there's like Let's the best part up, I can it? say for the climactic set is there's a just a sign that says if you don't know ask <laughs> yeah, the and that is like the, is just, what are these it is signs? such a weird detail that it kind of makes that set work but mm, and like it is very much so this is certainly the weakest climax of like most of the, the i mean you know, i would say this is even weaker than dr no in places it is just yeah and oh, dr God, no yeah. i can understand they didn't have the money to do this mm. like they did the best they could it's just you know, when you have one million dollars for the whole movie, uh, and not just mm. for one sequence, you mm. kind of got to cut some corners. Yeah, even though obviously the doc, as we said in the Doctor No episode, they they got like an extra two hundred fifty just to blow stuff up, and it's still like, <laughs> yeah, 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 you're gonna have to use that, you know, absolutely just for this. And it's like, okay. Yeah. It just is, and I and I feel this. The problem, even if you compare it to, um, you know, you only live twice. It's underwhelming. It's like you, yeah, you've gone from the spectacle of, you know, Blofeld has a volcano to Blofeld has an a a you know an oil rig in, in Barger, California. <laughs> and we are going to go to the best locations in Japan and shoot them beautifully. To um, it's Las Vegas. It, you know yeah. what Las Vegas is? I mean, we'll show you some of the... We'll show you one Las Vegas show, which... Weirdly racist thing, where they... Pretend to have a woman from Africa who can turn into a gorilla. And mm. it's just like... This movie stops here for two minutes mm. to be here. What? Yeah. what okay. You, yeah. you specifically wanted this. I mean, like, I get the circus circus act, because that's... That's remarkable. That's these people are doing impressive stuff, and you have the camera zooming around them, and they're zooming around you, and it's cool. Mm -hmm. And you have an, you know, an elephant playing the slot machines. I mean, as a sight gag. I mean, it. That's part of the movie's camp. But you know, I, I like, I like funny elements, elephants playing slots. It's cool. <laughs> uh, but it's yeah. Then they go to Las Vegas, and it's the desert, and. Then they have a dune buggy chase where they couldn't have actual henchmen. They have security guards, and yeah, it's just it's just this is a this is a this is a, I feel like this this film is a, and obviously we will start to see this more as we come on to uh, Roger Moore. This is like Bond on the back foot. This is starting to you go okay. Uh, now Bond has to react to. You know, market forces. This is Bond having to be, you know, a product. And you know, mm. oh, this product now has to match, you know, what we expect from a Bond film. You know, this is what people expect from a Bond film. Now we have to uh, produce this because, you know, they didn't like uh, on Her Majesty's Secret Service, despite the fact that, 
you know, as we discussed in the last episode, it's a masterpiece. We now have to produce this thing, and it's like, okay. But it's just yeah. boring. It's, it's boring. It's, it's a boring a nothing film. of a film that they felt like they made because they had to make it. And mm. it shows up all over the place. Mm. Like... I mean, it's not that they don't care. They absolutely do care. They, The money cleared the bank and they're going to do the best they can with the material they have. And I think Sean Connery does well with what he has. He has some, you know, good banter. And But this movie is like, as like one of the biggest franchises in the world, I mean, even then it was, you know, making hand over fist money. Like it could like astounding amounts of money for that time that this is what you choose to do with it is strange. Mm. It just feels, it feels, as I said, I think it feels like, you know, the, the possibly the worst of the Connery era. Yeah. Because there's nothing, you know, you can say, you know, a, a lot of nice things about, you know, the other films of Connery's period, you know, obviously you got to realise that some of these are basically laying the groundwork of what a Bond film actually is, and then obviously some of them are, you know, a little bit hamstrung by what they try to do technically and what they try to do, you know, in terms of setting. And okay, yeah, you can go, oh, they're racist, they're sexist, etc. But they feel like a forward momentum. This feels like a back a backward slide in almost every aspect. Absolutely. Uh, so, <laughs> tomorrow we're going on to the Roger Moore era. Where we get Live the... and let die. And yes. even though <laughs> Sean Connery says the best way to listen to the uh, music of the Beatles is headphones, we have a Beatle doing the theme. See you tomorrow. <laughs>